Welcome to Layback with Betfair. Joined by the A-Team, we're back. Hello listeners and welcome to a huge edition of Layback with Betfair as we gear up for day two of the championships at Royal Randwick and what a fantastic car to racing is there. We'll be dissecting that card in depth today on the program. We'll also take a little look later in the show just around Bendigo and some of our bests from Morfittville as well, which is a black type card over in SA as the racing starts to get hot there, which is a nice little segue into our first man who's the pride of South Australia, Mitch Lewis. Uh, Mitchie, welcome to you. G'day footy, thanks for having me back. Yeah, good show last week, so it uh, looks like they've kept us on. And g'day down the line to my old mate Dino there. Uh, stacks to get stuck into this week, so looking forward to it. Absolutely. Dean Watling, we welcome in as well. There's no feedback. There's no better feedback than being asked to come back seven days later, is there, Dino? Yeah, I do like the quick backup. Just hopefully no second up syndrome from me and Mitchie, but a pleasure to be back on with you two. Uh, mouth-watering week. We got through last week somehow in Sydney with the rain, and this week looks to be even better. So I can't wait to chat about it. And I think we've got a couple of different opinions, footy, so that will be exciting. Yeah, there's some opposing views as I scroll Ooh. through the layback run sheet, which is exciting because that's what racing's all about. But before we get into that serious stuff, let's head to the lay bin. And uh, Dino, you you bought some you bought some really insightful stuff last week around ghosting okay. and dating apps. And I'm keen to see what sort of highbrow stuff you've brought to the lay bin this week. Before I get to my lay, my lay been last week was puffer jackets or vests with short sleeve shirts and Mitchie's come on this week I don't know if trying to alpha me but he's worn the exact the outfit which I put in the lady last week he's he got the puffer too. vest on and, and this, so I don't I don't know what he's trying to do but I don't mind it Mitchie I don't mind it um my I'll stand by what I said last week. It's climate related, Dino. Not all of us are blessed with sunshine every day up on, on their back. So when, when you move down into some of these southern states, I reckon you'd probably pick it up. So don't worry about it. That's inflammatory behaviour by you, Mitch, wearing that vest. And just the beanie to top it off. Just if It didn't put me over the edge. The beanie on top. Just the, uh, Anyway, this week is an interesting one. A lot of chat. Solar, lunar eclipses. I don't know if you saw on the news. It was all over my social media. They boast about them being a one in a million event and how rare they are. I reckon there's been more solar leaders at Canterbury in my lifetime. So they can get in the lay bin. Um, you got to wear glasses, these weird glasses to look at it anyway. It's just a dot in the sky with a little bit of sun around it. So I think they're absolutely overrated and go straight in the lay bin this week. Woody? I love it, mate. Get get in the bin, <laughs> solar or lunar eclipses. All right, that's a first. <laughs> Mitch, keep, keep it rolling, mate. Yeah, right. I, I'll, I've added a quick one here because i got a side swipe with the beanie as well. So Dino's in the lay bin. I, I don't know. Are you allowed to comment on people's fashion if you only wear white T-shirts? Like, <laughs> if you only stick to one, um, I'm not sure if you can have too much more of an opinion, but that's okay. I've got, I've got a more serious one to touch on here. So... Um, I did scope this out earlier in my house so that I, I'm not going to disappear off the world or anything like that. But I'm putting my wife in the lab in this week, boys. So um, I'm a little bit like uh, me and Dana, I think we're, we're into our boxing and sort of things like that. I'm a bit of a UFC fan as well. Sunday, the UFC 300 is on. So for those that don't know, uh, probably they do the pay-per-views, one, two, three, four count all the way up. So every hundred, they do a big, big card, big full day. And I've got a few mates keen to watch and everything like that. And that's fine. Uh, my wife, without having a look at what else was going on in the world, she's got a couple of friends playing in the Women's Footy League Grand Final this weekend, and that's great. Super. They're well done to the North girls for making the Grand Final. Chelsea, without looking at the draw, put her hand up and said, we'll definitely come down and support you. We'll have a look. Turns out that the game is a two-hour drive there and a two-hour drive back, making it a four-hour round trip for the Sunday. She hasn't realised where the game is. Said, oh, I'll be there in full colours. Don't you worry. So now I'm going to spend my Sunday afternoon in a car to drive mm. two hours one way and two hours back, missing one of the biggest MMA events for a long time, just to, just to sit there in the car for most of the day. So flattening Chelsea, unfortunately, she goes in the bin for poor planning, we'll say. What a, what a supportive life partner yeah. we have <laughs> yeah. here in Mitch Lewis. I would not want to go to war with you, Mitch. Uh, but thank you for sharing, <laughs> nonetheless. Um, no, boys. that's okay. It's the same thing. It, sh- it could have been around the corner and we've been right. She, she just needs to 
Before you commit, you just need to have a look what, what where exactly we're going. That's up, that's up there with laying autumn angel and it drifting to seven dollars by jump, isn't it? Oh, so yeah. you're doing the right thing, but by the end, it's like, was it even worth it? And is it is it after as well talking about how you lay short price faves and then the one you've laid actually jumped at seven dollars? <laughs> Correct. So enjoy your seven dollar trip, four hour round trip. <laughs> Uh, boys, I'm putting uh, I'm putting racing analysts that have their cake and eat it too in the lay bin this week. Um, I reckon if there's there's so many great opinions in racing, and if you want to have a bet on something, you have a bet on it and you back it. Don't put a foot in each camp. If you say I'm not betting at a particular track today, don't then go ahead and celebrate when your on top selection lobs or the horse you said, or the favourite loses, you cannot have your cake and eat it too in this game. Either front up, put some skin in, have some cash on, or just don't play at all and stay out. And don't say your little, hash, your little hashtag here, Dino, pays to listen, unless you <laughs> put something on, because $0 doesn't pay, your on top it doesn't pay. So form analysts that want to have their cake and eat it too, they are well and truly in the lay bin for me this week, boys. Uh, coming in I hot. I don't mind that. Yeah, yeah. Coming it's, in it's, it's nice though when you can sit on both sides of it because you just look good and when they don't, you don't say nothing. Exactly. We, it's, we're not in a game where you win every time. The reality is no, if you're going very true. just over 20%, you're pretty bloody good, aren't you? Yeah, so exactly. you don't have to win all the time. That's okay. Just pass it. Um, boys, enough of the lay bin. Let's get into Royal Randwick, day two of the championships. What a cracking car. There's some super races. We've obviously got the Group 1 Australian Oaks, the Group 1 Sydney Cup, Group 1 Queen Elizabeth Stakes, and the Group 1 Queen of the Turf. But then the other black type races around that, the support card is outstanding. Uh, we spoke about the track at the top of the show, and the track was outstanding last week. Gave it absolutely none. We, we go blue and We'll talk about it until we're blue in the face in regards to if the weather's mm. poor or if tracks aren't prepared well. So the Randwick um, track staff are well and truly on the backboard this week uh, for preparing what a wonderful yeah. racing track day one. What does it mean for day two, Dino, in terms of how we play the track, patterns, and how's it going to come up on Saturday? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Obviously, props to Michael Wood. It was outstanding last week. Uh, he spoke this morning and suggested that it was originally going to be plus a three-metre rail the entire, but just with that wear and tear and getting off the inside last week, they pushed it from the four-metre position from 1,400 to the winning post. What does that mean? Around week, I think you look at the six-metre mark as sort of the camber of the track. Either side of that is where you want to be and where we saw horses close off in. So I think it'll be a little bit more on speed suited this week compared to last week. I think last week, if anything, you sort of wanted to be off rails and get in the middle part of the track and running on. So I played it fair enough, but I think forward of midfield footy is the spot to be this week at Randwick. Love your work. Hey, we'll start off in race number four, boys, which is the Group 2 Percy Sykes Stakes, uh, over 1,200 metres. And last year, the race was won by Chris Dilley from Tis Invincible and Kamachi And... Look, it's a, it's a really nice addition again this year, boys. And I like looking at the sheet because there's a few like-minded individuals here. And Mitch, I might get you to preview uh, the Percy Sykes for us. Kick us off. Yeah, so obviously, super race. You've got Lady Camelot, the Golden Slipper winner, in the race at a short price. Um, look, I'm not game to lay her. Uh, she, barrier 13 at a big weight, to me, is a question mark. But she's clearly got a lot of class. So in saying I'm not keen to lay her, I think I can find value around her. And the horse that I've sort of zeroed in on was the 12 Amina. So this horse won its first two starts. Then it turned up at Flemington, ran down the straight, definitely in the wrong part of the track. I think it's lightly raced, has a light weight. James McDonald in the saddle. Um, if you wanted to back this horse each way, you're getting a better place price than you are for Lady Camelot. I think this horse, Amina, has got good upside. Uh, and I think it's definitely set to run a pretty good race here. Love your work. And uh, Dino, you're of a similar vein to, to Mitch in this race with Amina as well. Yeah, I'm on the bandwagon. I just think the price of Lady Camelot's too short, but I'm similar to Mitchy. I don't want to take her on because of her class, but you look at this race and look at history. The Percy Sykes is set weights and penalties. So you often see horses that don't come through the big ones getting really well with 54 kilos, 55 kilos and win this race. Lady Camelot 59 because she obviously won a golden slipper. She was scratched out of the size last week. So it's a bit... Um, sort of 
interesting that she's actually here. So I don't want to take her on, but I think she's too short to back. I think Amina back to the inside last start at Flemington was really good. Um, that was sort of against the pattern of the day. And J-Mac, good gate. I think she is the bet in the race at a good each way odds footy. Yeah, gee, I'm, I'm with you guys in terms of I'm backing Amina one by three. Uh, I just She was back to that inferior part of the ground, wasn't she, in the Group 3 Thoroughbreds Breeders Stakes? And uh, I, I think she's drawn really well to sit behind that solid tempo and, and have the last say with J-Mac in the saddle. I, I'm actually going to go one further and be prepared to lay Lady of Camelot in, in this race. Just... If it was at level weights and she's drawn barrier five, then yeah, two bucks, no no dramas. But we, we're expected to take that price when um, she's giving market dangers like a Nisa and Amina four and five kilos. And I, I often have this discussion, like how many grand finals can you peak for in one preparation? So she just went under in a, in a ferociously run Blue Diamond where she just gave out late. And then she obviously is backed up in a fantastic training performance to win the Golden Slipper. Just seems a bit of an afterthought after being scratched last week um, here at 1,200. I'm prepared to lay at the price. So I'm making Lady Camelot a lay and Amina a one by three play. So a little bit on the table <laughs> first up here in race four for all three of us lads. I, I love it, solid start. And we're on the same wavelength, which I think we're going to drift off that wavelength as the show proceeds, which the listeners will love because we want a little bit of debate as well. Let's head to race five, the group two Arrowfield for the three-year-olds. Uh, set weights, 1,200 metres. Last year was won by half cabin from Wee Nessie and Lady Laguna. Uh, Dino, how are you seeing this one unfold, mate? Yep, the speed map's uh, the most fascinating thing here. I think you blink and you'll miss them. 1,200 metres, it's a kind enough start. You can sort of peel into the race in that three-wide line, but there is an absolute abundance of speed. I'm happy enough to have a little two-bet play here. I want to be backing one that's going to settle on speed and one that's going to close if they go too hard. Osmosis, obviously, um, had issues in the Galaxy. Read at the start, Rachel King was lucky to stay in the saddle. I was out there on Tuesday uh, with the tre- Breakfast with the Stars when he galloped. I think if he brings his best form, gate four, he can lead, he can take a sit. I think he has enough juice in his price. And the one out of the trials that I really, really like is Jolly Star. Probably not one that many punters will gravitate towards. But if you do get a chance, fellas, take a look at those trials because they're outstanding. Do go lickety split up front. I think Jolly Star will be closing over the top. So little two-bet play for me in um, the Arrowfield. What did you you touched on Jolly Star's trial and she had a tick over, didn't she, on Monday this week? Is that right? So, is what do you make of that sort of play from the particular camp on on a Monday, sort of six days out from race day? Is that a big plus for you as a, as a trial perv, Dino? Yeah, it's interesting. It's some horses are backfires. We saw Zapatea do it in the ornament. It backfired for her. Um, sometimes it can take a, a little bit of sort of freshness out of their legs, uh, which I don't tend to like. But in saying that, that work was good. She was on the bridle. She closed off really, really nicely. Um, it's an interesting setup. I love the Chris Wallace stable fresh. Um, they keep them really fresh at the trials, which means when we get to race day, they often explode first up and flat second up. Whereas the opposite to that is Wardhouse and Bot. They push them out of the trials. They tend to need that first up run and they peak second up. So um, interesting setup, but um, I like it. I like it here. Love your work. Um, Mitchy. how are you seeing this one? Yeah, so tricky enough race for me in the fact that I can make a genuine case for a handful of these runners, five or six of them. So in saying that, um, like what you put in the lay-bin earlier uh, here, footy, uh, I'm going to give my on-top selection as learning to fly. Some of the viewers and the listeners, they like to know what you would put on top just to reaffirm their own selections. Um, So learning to fly goes on top for me. I think, um, like we said last week, she didn't run. I think the 1,200 metres, she she's set to explode late uh, coming down from the 14 to the 12. Um, but th- for my personal point of view, there's too many in this race for me to want to back confidently. Yeah, I'm with you, Mitchie. And j- just to just close off on that lay bin as well, I'm more than happy for you to have an on topper. But if I see you go as per <laughs> lay back on top, bang, pays to listen, there will be, there will be a lawsuit. I'm telling you. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, look, this is a really hard race. So, um, race. yeah, really it is a good race. race. So I, I'm really keen to see uh, how Schwartz performs second up here as well. I feel he's one of these ones that have 
really furnished into their three-year-old season. Um, I would have just liked to have seen that race probably rate a touch better first up when he was beaten by the late Brave Mead. So uh, learning to fly, don't know what to make of the draw and, and the map, particularly, Dean, you're talking about the track conditions, perhaps being on speed as well. So there's a little bit too much doubt for me as well. So I'm going to shoulder arms in this particular race and, and with like you are, Mitchie, and uh, all the best, Dino, with your two bets there in Osmosis and, and Jolly Star. Uh, let's head now to race number six on the card, which is the Group 1 Australian Oaks for the three-year-old fillies, 2,400 metres. Uh, last year's edition was won by Penny Wecker from So Dazzling and uh, Premise. Uh, this is a mouthwatering little clash we've got here because we see Orchestral uh, go up against the likes of Zardozzi and Tuta La Vida once more. And you can throw in the likes of Autumn Angel on the quick backup from last week down in the weights as well, which adds a little bit of flavour and perhaps the forgotten runner in Quintessa. Uh, the other forgotten Kiwi, perhaps, in the race. But Orchestral, well, incredibly short in the market. Dean, can you get involved at that price? I can't get involved at that price at all, um, especially over 2,400 metres. I think she's very suited. I think last time we probably saw her staying us come to the fore late when Jamo put the whip away with 200 to go and she just kept finding. I think she wins the race. Do I want to take the price? No. Does she drift? I'm not sure. I think it's a race that I'll sit back and maybe enjoy, boys. Um uh, Love the backup, though, of Autumn Angel. That's the point I wanted to touch on. She was terrific last week, 61 kilos. Love her in this race. Just adds layers. And probably you're getting a little bit more juice in your price footy just because she's... Yeah, no, totally agree. And I really wanted to find Autumn Angel because I love that <laughs> setup, seven-day backup from yep. the Adrian Knox. That two-horse wall with good banner, heavy nine coming back on top and, you know, drops five kilos off that run. But I just think she'll be a touch-out class still. So I'm going to shoulder arms. Mitch, are you going to have a bet? Yeah, no, I'm shouldering arms as well. I think Dan, I touched on similar. Orchestral, I think, is going to be really hard to beat. In a race like this, normally I'd probably look for a place play. Um, but even the ones that I consider to be the major threats of the top three, I'm getting no value in those sort of place markets either, which which is fair enough. The, um, the top sort of end of this race all stand out. So shouldering arms from my point of view and watching orchestral probably win it. Yeah. And I kind of feel when you don't have a bet in a race like this and there is a dollar fifty five pop, just the racing fan in me goes, geez, I hope she just comes out and puts a hole in this field and sort of announces yeah. herself as sort of this generational filly. That's that's my feel in a race like this when I'm not betting or having a financial interest. So um, let's yep. sit back and cheer <laughs> racing in the Australian Oaks voice. That's a good way to summarise it. It's like if you're not going to allow us to bet in this race, the, the performance better be special. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. Don't, don't don't turn it up. Don't turn up and win yeah. Autumn Angel, please. Um, <laughs> race number seven is the Group 1 Sydney Cup run under handicap conditions, 3,200 metres. Explosive Jack won the race last year from True Marvel and Knight's Order. Uh how are we seeing this one, uh, Mitch Lewis? It, it looks as though um, it looks as though you're keen to sort of have a bit of hamburger and the lot type stuff in this race. Yeah, so and definitely look, I, I don't mind my sort of uh, two mile races. I think generally you you sort of favour yourself when you look for horses that can they're proven at the trip. So the two that I identified that I thought were most proven at the trip was the two Ash Run. Uh, his Melbourne Cup run was obviously sound uh, fourth that year. I think the build-up into this race has been okay. He was lame last start, so perhaps he could have finished closer, but I think it sets up really well for Ash run. And the other one as well, my old mate Ahmad, geez, he's a soldier. That Adelaide Cup run was unbelievable, um, but he's also won three and placed in another two over this trip. So he sees the trip out. We've even seen him recently see the trip out without really any jockey. So they're the two that I've identified. At this stage, I'm going to lay the favourite. So I'm willing to take on Circle of Fire. Um, look, the last start win was good, but this is a lightly raced horse. This is a much harder race. Um, yes, he's light at the weights, but Barrier 15 and an international jockey that hasn't ridden on this track before concerns me just a little bit. I think it's not going to take much for Circle of Fire to be in quite an awkward position, and he's, he's going to have to get a little bit of luck late, I think, if that's the case. So... Um, and not proven at the trip either. Uh, there's a few question marks for me, so I'm willing to take Circle of Fire on Dino. Yep, a terrific race. It's been a little bit flipped on its head, boys. Obviously, we had um, more felons, which was uh, the favourite at the start of the week, injured out, uh, Circle of Fire, which I love um, prior to the barrier draw, but 
think the only thing I can add to this race, because I'm not betting, is the 3,200 metre start. Really, really tricky. There's about 100 metres to the first turn. Um, so horses draw wide. You're in an awful position in a big field. You've either got to roll forward, use your tactical speed, or your car three, four wide. So not betting, hard race footy, but that's all I can add for you. Yeah, um, no, it's good insight regardless, Dino. And, and I think when you see Ahmad there, we've just got to give a, a shout out to Zach Spain's undercarriage whenever we look at that Adelaide Cup run. Um, it was some real frozen pea stuff and we need to acknowledge that as men uh, in their 30s. Or well, certainly I am. I'm not sure about you, Lux. But uh, <laughs> I think we the scene the crime as well. I think Zach Spain's back in, saddled back up at Adelaide this week as well. So it's obviously hopefully not too many demons for him. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey, I, I respect your view, uh, Mitchie, around runners that are proven at the distance. I, I'm sort of opposing that and I'm backing Circle of Fire at around $5 just based on the, the horse being on the up here. I like the uh, the backup through that Group 2 chairman's quality where one in impressive fashion, closing from the back. Um, I think the trip's going to suit. It's an exciting import for the Mar team. Um, first time out over 3,200. That doesn't look too much of an issue uh, for me. And look, you're right. He's going to have to take his medicine from the back, but could just have a bit of class on these. Like uh, in terms of um, upside, I, I couldn't believe when you look through this and you've got the likes of Cal. I still can't believe Calipore is a group one winner. So in terms of depth, I'm not convinced on the race. And I think something can come up and, and stamp their group one credentials and circle of fires that horse for me. So I'll be back in number 12, circle of fire in race seven, the Sydney Cup. Uh, before we attack the remainder of the program, we've got to go to our back to school segment, which isn't really an education segment this week. It's a little bit of a this is your life type stuff because our <laughs> Betfair, our lay, loyal layback with Betfair listeners need to know who these absolute two gurus are that are coming online with me from all over Australia this week. Uh, and we want to ask how, how you got into the great game because Everyone's got a different story about how they fell in love with the game. A lot of people are born into it. Uh, I'll be interested to uh, hear how your passion for, for racing and then obviously getting into the form started. Uh, Dino, what about yourself? Yep, uh, mine's a little bit interesting. And I sort of love the setup. I definitely wasn't born in racing. I have no real ties to it at all. I fell in love with the game through two separate incidents. Um, one was at the 2010 Melbourne Cup. An old man asked me for three selections to put a half trifecta on for himself. Uh, My Lucky Day, uh, American, and So You Think um, obviously won that trifecta. Um, and it was sort of got, got me sort of into the game. And then uh, a mare like Winks come along and I sort of got on the journey and followed her through all of the starts. Didn't really enjoy the betting side of it, just more watched her and then as soon as I turned 18, that's when I'm also got into the form side. Um, I love the process. I love the whole fascinating side of racing, which I didn't know anything about because I wasn't born in racing from there. Um, I just want to take it a little bit more seriously and then um, sort of got the bug for racing, met the right people, networked my way up, met people like Chris Camilleri, Tom Haylock, um, a certain amount of people. And then um, I think that sort of obsession just turned into wanting to be the best form Alice I can be. I found a niche in watching trials and I find that as my biggest edge. And from there, I think it's just you meet the people you meet in racing. And from there, I've sort of got the bug boys. So um, interesting start. And I love to push it because some people think that you've got to be born into racing to be a form analyst or to work in the industry. And I'm all for um, that you don't have to be. If you love it and you're passionate about it and you work hard, you can sort of get to where you want to be in this, game, um, this great game. Yeah, I love hearing that because, to be honest, Dino, and I, I know you reasonably well, I, I just assumed you were born into racing just with um, just with your, your passion and your knowledge of, of where you're at in your form and uh, and analysing races week to week. And, and I'm sorry that Tom Haylock was one of those guys that yeah. you had to connect with uh, throughout. But, uh, you know, you've got, to take, you've got to take the hits in this game and you've done that. So congratulations. Uh, Mitchie, what about you? A bit of a different story for yourself? Yeah, slightly different. And I guess in the fact, Dino's talking about being born into it. I guess you could say that from my point of view, but not in a sort of sense of an industry type or anything like that. So it was a great passion of my grandfather's, the racing and his brother as well. Um, and they used to own horses and various things back in the day. I think they had a, I think they had an Adelaide Cup second placer with old, uh, you know, Bart Cummins years ago and stuff like that. So um, I've sort of grown up knowing little bits and pieces of it. And then I guess as I got slightly older, uh, perhaps my father wasn't into it as much. Um, so it sort of 
sat there in the background for a little while. And then, yeah, as I got older, I sort of slowly started to buy some horses and starting to own my own horses again in small shares and syndicates and stuff like that. And as that developed, that turned into, oh, well, here, I want to have a look if I'm actually a chance in this race. And then people would say, oh, well, what do you think will win this? And eventually I developed it into riding form, um, starting obviously at Morfittville. Uh, I'd, have, I'd have a group of people message me on weekends and say, can you send us what, you know, your tips at Morfittville? And then someone suggested to me, why don't you make a website? And gradually I've just expanded and built and built into being a position now where, yeah, I do form across the country and um, heard over the radio. So it's just sort of worked in that sort of sense that um, it might be a little bit boring in a sense, but yeah, I, I just own some horses, uh, developed it into uh, doing my own form to see if I could actually make money off back of my own horses. No, I love it, mate. There's nothing boring about that. You two blokes are absolute gurus and stars on the rise. So it's great to have you on the layback with uh, Betfair show for these uh, couple of weeks while we're sort of programming online. That's great to hear your stories. I'm sure the listeners are appreciative of that as well. Um, let's get stuck into these final three races uh, on the Royal Randwick card for day two of the championships. It's the feature, isn't it? It's the Group 1 Queen Elizabeth Stakes, 2,000 metres, the Cox Plate of the North, boys. That's what it is. And mm. uh, we got uh, – uh, what an addition it was last year. Dubai Honour obviously winning from Moonga and Animo. Um, this year sets up for a fascinating race to dissect because – we got the likes of Via Sestina, who was a very impressive first up winner here in Australia. How does she shape up here with a very different looking speed map, Dean Watling? Yep, very different looking speed map and very different looking tempo. Uh, you referenced that first up run. I think me and you, uh, or us three, could have run quicker to the 600 meter mark than they did there. So it was a pure sit and sprint. In Birkenstocks. We, we could have, even with the Randwick track flooded, probably. Um, <laughs> But it's just a completely different setup. Sit and sprint to, from the 600 metre mark, first sectional strength come to the four. Now we get Pride of Jenny at the front. So we know how this race is going to be run. It's going to be run fastly. Is she going to stand up? Interesting look at her profile. Yes, she had faster run races back overseas, but she's never been really tested past 2,000 metres. So does that tell me that maybe they have a query of that? I think if you figure that out, you'll figure the race out. Um, I like this race. I think it's speed map. We reference a 2,000 metre start. I think that's very crucial. You got about 75 meters to the first turn. So horses drawn out wide that want to roll forward. They're a little bit cast and horses drawn inside that want to roll forward. You can pinch a length or two and really get an advantage here, which I think Pride of Jenny will do. She is a bet for me in this race. I think Declan Bates, the stable, the horse will learn a lot out of that run at Flemington. Um, I think the big long back straight of Randwick suits her. And I want to have a little spec on Buckaroo. He's only length off via Sustainer. Um, two starts back. He was good last start over 2,400 metres. I think he's an out-and-out 2,000-metre out horse. He should camp on the back of Pride of Jenny with Shin in the saddle. So another little two-bet play, but the main bet here, footy, would be on Pride of Jenny. I can't wait to see her around Randwick. Oh, I love your work, mate. Great assessment. Uh, Mitchy. we have an opposing view here, don't we? Let yeah, it rip. Yeah, which makes for good listening here. <laughs> Let it rip. Right, so... Via Sestina for me goes on top. Now, as I did the form, I originally went to Pride of Jenny. I was very impressed with her run at Flemington. But the, the deeper I dove into Via Sestina, to me, it just it screams a horse that's going to improve second up here. So I know that there's the narrative that off the slow tempo is the sit and sprint. I actually don't think that would have suited her. We know these European horses are generally brought up on much hotter tempos. I think a horse like Pride of Jenny coming into that race is, is going to give it a tempo that suits her a lot better. And I know Dean, I said he had a question mark over some of um, her 2000 metre record previously, but she's her last two runs in Europe, she was second at group one level over the 2000 metres. We've seen horses come out and win races, including Circle of Fire. His his last European race was a class one or three or something like that. We've, we've got a genuine European group one horse here who I think is actually going to get a better tempo this race. I think she, her class just saw her through the last win. I think we'll see the best of her here second up now. Love your work. So backing via Sestina, Dino backing Buckaroo and Pride of Jenny. I'm also got a back and a lay bet here. I'm backing Pride of Jenny. She's as gutsy as they yeah. come. Four bucks 20. You have to entertain as a bet. The 2000 meters was the question mark in the Oz Cup. And although she got nabbed late by um, the Benjamin Button of racing in Cascadian, she certainly <laughs> still ticked the 2000 meter box in defeat yeah. for me. Uh, I, I love what you say about 
how Randwick's going to suit her, Dean. That short, um, you know, that short um, gallop into the first turn, the back straight. She's going to Declan Bates is just he's he's at one with this horse. He's absolutely at one with her. So prior to Jenny on top for me and a bet, and I'm going to lay via Sestina just to just throw, and I'm going to make via Sestina maybe even my lay streak bet. We might get to that a little bit later, just as a bit of controversy. But her winning the Ramford that was courtesy of. The most pedestrian pace you are likely to see in Group One race. It ran twenty-one point two lengths outside the Group One average to the six hundred. This is a vastly different setup. Respect to what you say, Mitch. That they are faster tempos in Europe, but not prior to Jenny tempos. This is completely new, completely different. I I, I feel for Via Sestina two twenty. No, not for me. So laying Via Sestina backing prior to Jenny in what I feel is going to be an incredibly exciting edition of the Queen Elizabeth Stakes. Uh, let's head to race nine, which is the Group 1 Queen of the Turf Stakes. It's for the fillies and mares. It's run under weight for age conditions over the mile. What do you like here, Dean, and how is it going to set up from a map perspective? Yep, the map's, uh, again, crucial. 1,600-metre start, completely throw everything we've just said about the 3,200 and 2,000-metre. It is as kind as it comes. You've got the entire back straight to sort your order out, so the speed map's pretty easy. You've got gotchas there up front. A tissue's probably close enough. You've got Tropical Squall Ford, Samana, and a couple of others. So genuine enough tempo, really good race. A uh, couple of things in here. The wet track last week in a Doncaster has just bolstered this race. So we saw Zugotcha scratchy out of it, Samana, Tropical Squall, a couple of others. So this has turned into a proper Group 1 contest. My make, and I'm a big stats man, Zugotcha's record boy, 1,200 metres and under. She's had six starts for two wins. 1,200 metres plus, she's had eight starts for five wins. So I love the setup here. 1,600 metres, she's going to camp on the back of the likely leader, Tropical Squall. She'll get every possible from there. And another note, any time I see a Chris Waller horse win second up, um, all I want to be is we've on them third up because his horses often um, peak first up, regress second up, and then peak again third and fourth up. So she suits my profile of punting, and I'm very keen to be with race nine, number two, Zugotcha. Woody? Love your work. I'm I'm going to be siding here with number 14, Tropical Squall, at around seven bucks. And you just know what you're going to get with this filly. And Hippo to press forward from barrier three, dictate proceedings, the only natural leader of the race. And what I like here, you speak of profiles, Dino, with Waller runners. I really like that Tropical Squall ran a really, uh, ran a big career peak figure last prep when winning third up in the group one flight stakes over the mile. So I expect the same again this time in, peaking third up um, from the front. You know, no knock Zoo Gotcha, but Zoo Gotcha is going to have to go past Tropical Squall, and I think she's going to be mighty hard to hold out. Seven bucks, Tropical Squall. I'll have some of that. Uh, Mitchie, what about yourself? Uh, same thing for me. I was probably going to have no bet. I could make a case. I like both of you guys' cases on your horses, but I'll throw a tissue into the mix. I don't mind the 2,000 back to the 1,600 metres. She's actually the horse that won this race last year, so if she doesn't get too far back from barrier two, I think she's got a touch of class. So... I think a tissue on top, but no bet for me. All right. So backing, not backing anything, Mitchie. He's got an a tissue on top, but he's not going to tweet about it if he <laughs> wins. Uh, Dean Watling is backing Zoo Gotcha laying a tissue. And uh, Yes. I did yes. touch on that just then, but I want to be against the heat. I know Mitchie likes to set up 2,000 back to 16. I'm in the other end of the court. I don't like that profile, especially off a, I think it was a little bit of a gut bust the last start, the way that race was run. I would have loved to see her in the Queen Elizabeth. And just from the gate back to 1,600 metres, she's only ever done it once in her life. I would like to be against that profile, um, especially with a stable mate who's rising in trip. I think that's a much better betting profile for myself. So yeah, laying... So Virtually putting Chris Waller and his strategies in the lay bin. That's what you're telling me. put words in my mouth. Yeah. He's gone the second to third up, Chris Waller, yes. And then he's gone the Chris Waller back to 1,600 metres, no thanks. So get him in the Waller camp. Oh, Dean, Dean Duckworth. Look at him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Boys, let's move to the last on the card, race 10, the Group 2 Sapphire Stakes. Um, last year, this race was won by Zapateo uh, from Never Talk and Princess Grace. And look, Red Card has come up $2.60 corporates here. And you two boys, the the gurus, the, the gurus from interstate uh, taking a set against Red Card. Tell us why, Mitch Lewis. 
Yeah, so a few little things that I think are just against red card. Uh, to start off the barrier, um, obviously drawn out wide, uh, has early speed. It's probably going to have to spend a little bit to get across. So that's the first little concern for me. For a horse as well, that's probably better suited at the 1,000 or 1,100 metres. I think the 1,200 metres, if you've got to spend a few extra tickets early, potentially could be the undoing late. Uh, and uh, other horses, I think, in the race get quite a little bit of a better setup. So I'm expecting someone like Wee Nessie could potentially try and hold red card out wide, which this is where I think the undoing is going to be. So I've lent the way of Soltaire. Uh, this horse, it does tease a lot. It's only won one from 11. Um, but I think from barrier two, if we can hold a position around midfield, the first up win uh, was quite impressive. And previously in her preps, she showed that second up is generally where she does her best work. So Soltaire on top for me and against red card due to his race map, basically. Soltaire on top for Mitchie and betting as well. Dan McPherson in the ownership group there could be the most suave man in racing, Dan McPherson, outside of your vest and beanie combination. <laughs> uh, Mitch, what about you, Dean? Why are you laying red card? Yeah, it's simple for me. It's price. Uh, I just think two wins is preparation over 1,100 metres from better setups where we've gotten better odds. Now we get an inferior setup and we're asked to take the shortest price all preparation. So that is simply why I want to take on red card. I think the last 50 metres, we are standing next to each other. It'd be a good watch because we'll both probably have heart in our mouths because I think uh, she'll be there the last 50. It's just whether or not she gets nabbed by something footy. So can you tell us why you're with it? Yep, I, like I, think, I think she'll win the race and I think you'll get a better price on race day with her as well. I reckon she'll start closer to threes than this 250 that she sort of opened up at with corporates. And, I'm not convinced there's as much speed in this race inside as you blokes suggest. I think uh, Hippo will find the top quite comfortably. He rides this mare a treat, two from two in the saddle, tick over trial between runs, has her ready to win at 1,200 metres. So red card on top for me, but back BSP punters, red card. I think you'll get a better price closer to jump with her. So a little bit of head-to-head -head for us to finish off lads, which we got to like. Um, hey, before we get into our lay streak bets, uh, I want to just touch on the Masters. It's Masters week, green jackets. Uh, you'll have a green vest, a green vest on next week, I reckon, Mitch Lewis, if we invite you back as the, as the leader of layback. Um, there's currently 11 mil in liquidity in the win markets for the Masters. So, and you're getting better prices on the exchange. So if you want to have a bet on the golf, you love your golf, hop onto Betfair, um, take a look. There's a stack of all types of markets around what the uh, Masters can provide. So it's not just win, it's not just outright winning markets. And then also, I don't know if you blokes are following the US election at all. It's an absolute, <laughs> it's an absolute reality television show, the US election. <laughs> But there is 27 mil US in liquidity over there for the US election. So uh, if you are wanting to get involved, it is, it's, there's a lot more interest than race one at Maui. That's for sure. There's a lot in there. So if you want to get on, Masters, US election, Betfair's got all your needs for that, fellas. Uh, any golf tips? Um, I don't. I love the golf. My tip would be do not play golf with our good mate Tommy Haylock because he, if he was on there, I'd be laying him. <laughs> Are you better than him? I played with Tom Haylock, and he was he's uh, his short game was a little bit off the day I played with him, but he was getting off the tee okay. Yeah, I think he he tries to cover drive the ball. I think he needs <laughs> to stick to cricket. Yeah. What about you, Mitchie? You got any uh, U.S. election bets on? <laughs> no, I must say, I um, I did see that the the head to head for the two main candidates is almost about broke even. I did see a tweet about that the other day. So apart from that, uh, I, I couldn't tell you where the advantages are. It's the wild west over there. So uh, no bet from me there as well. And then so when when one gets up. I'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, old, imagine having the old cake and eat it too. I, I, I really like Donald Trump, but I got Joe Biden on top. Uh, yeah. who, who would know Too in that sort of election? Someone yeah. will swing. Yeah, someone will come from nowhere and take. Oh, who would know in America? <laughs> hey, let's get to our lay streak. And I'm not sure if you guys have seen the updated scores, but. It, it just uh, it just keeps on rolling on this juggernaut that uh, is referred to as N foot. Uh, I think I'm up <laughs> over a thousand bucks now. Uh, where are we going, boys? What's your lay? What's your lay of the weekend? 
Yep. I'll kick us off. Mine's Ramit Race 10, number one. A red car. We just touched on it. Reasons why. Too short. Wide gate. Um, so that is my lay of the week. Or, uh, yeah, lay of the week. Mitchie, what do you got for us? That mean Dino line up here. Red card was mine as well. Uh, map related uh, question marks around Mary's price over the 1200 metres. So uh, me and Dino line up. It's either going to be feast or famine for the new boys. <laughs> Boring. Mine's, uh, <laughs> mine's race, race eight, number eight, via Sestina. This is a real I like this. footing. Yeah. Ballsy. yeah, it's putting them on the line. And sometimes you've got to do that, particularly with a, a bank as large as my lay streak. But yeah, going to get a vastly different uh, race this week uh, off the back of that pedestrian uh, Rambit Stakes. So keen to see, I'm keen to eat humble pie if she's just too classy, but uh, I'm really liking pride to Jenny's chances there. Uh, boys, let's summarise and go around uh, around the grounds as well, because we've obviously got the, um, the big standalone meeting at Bendigo. We've got a beautiful black type uh, card there at Morpherville, which is your backyard. Mitch, what are some of your better bets for the weekend, mate? Yeah, well, I might zoom in on Morfittville, given this is one of the weekend's traditional lead-up for a lot of the races over the carnival. So you've got four listed races, two group threes. Uh, the Redelva, that's a listed race. That's probably a lead-up for the Sangster. You've got the Irwin Stakes, a good lead-up look at the Goodwoods. And the two group threes are lead-ups into the Oaks and the Derby. So I've probably got two best bets there. One I'm quite keen on. My best bet of the weekend is going to be race four, number one, Stretton Angel. I think uh, she's on her way to head towards the Sangster. I think it sets up nicely for this horse. I think she's got the class about her. We've seen her at Flemington uh, be competitive in Group 1s and stronger races, so I think it sets up for her. She's a winner at Morfittville as well, so I think her price at the minute is crazy. I'd want to be taking it earlier than later because I think uh, she'll get closer to Osmar. And then race 8, number 10, Benedetta. That's my other best bet there in the Irwin Stakes. I think this sets up nicely for Benedetta. Uh, Barrier 11, I'm not too concerned about. I think she'll be able to find some cover and I think the last start effort, fourth behind Cylinder and Imperatrice, only two lengths off, is screaming good form in the race like this. Love your work, Dino. You just love it, don't you? Mitchie Lewis talking about Morfittville. He just oh. drops the Commodore back, fourth back to third. The builds the revs. <laughs> <laughs> just up and about. I love it. I've got Someone's got to do it. Someone's got to fly the flag. I love Morfittville, man. Oh, I love it. Um, two outside of Randwick. Uh, race five, number 10, Moby Dick at Bendigo. That is a phenomenal bet. I think that will start much shorter. And race 10, number 10, Shelton Lane. One of the best first up horses you'll find. Jump outs have been slick. Good gate. Good setup. They're the two outside of the ones we've touched on at Randwick footy. Yeah, I'm with you. Race five, Bendigo, Moby Dick. That was just an impressive win, wasn't it? In 64 grade at Packenham, just hooked to the outside and just went through the gears, home fastest last 400 of the meeting, barely touched, looks pretty smart. So I'll be diving in at that price as well. I don't think that'll last. Uh, no. Race eight, the Bendigo Guineas, I'm going real exotic here, real wide, real big, rough. Number 18, all of her cantos, got to get a run, is an emergency at the moment, around 41 dollars corporates um look can run a cheeky race up to 1400 if she gets the run obviously touch one she's touch one pace first up went back to the inside 64 grade at sandown but her form in the new south wales provincials and we see this quite often when these provincial runners come to metropolitan melbourne it can stack up and i think second up can actually run a race at a really big price so we're having an each way bet on her if she gets the run and then with mitch in the redelva number one Stretton Angel, certainly one of mine. Estriella forms good form back around the bend at Morfittville where she's done it before and gets the cosy run from one. So there's some of my better bets from around the grounds as well, boys. Uh, been a lot of fun, fellas, uh, as it was last week. And fingers crossed we can get a few more results. So I think Mitch Lewis has said that on record that he was robbed with Stretton Angel getting out and... <laughs> No, no, Autumn, Autumn Angel. Autumn yeah. Angel, sorry, yeah. Autumn Angel. You can't, you can't beat BSP, unfortunately, mate, in the lay streak. So it is uh, what it is. Nah. If, uh, if, red card, if red card drifts to $8 and goes down, I reckon you'll still be flat. <laughs> yeah. um, boy, that... Especially when you come on here and say it's all price related, isn't it? So... <laughs> That's right. You look like a steal at $8. Price is king. Live and die by price. Isn't that right, Dino? Exactly. Yep. If in doubt, just say it's price related. <laughs> I love it. Hey, uh, enjoy the week. Don't get foot in both camps. Um, and we'll be back next week on Layback with Betfair.
are you really gambling with? For free and confidential support, call the number on the screen or visit the website.